Welcome everybody to our channel, Our Scientology Stories Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher and here with my co-host, Janice Gillen Brady. Brady. G'day everybody. How are you hey, doing you know, today, Mark, yeah. I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. And, I, and before we get into things, I want to bring up, someone made a comment about us talking about the weather, just chit-chatting. <laughs> and it got me thinking, and I know there's other people who have enjoyed listening about the weather. And it reminded me of when I first left the Sea Org. You know, and you know when you're in the Sea Org, you just, you're just into what you've got to get done. Right. And I was, in the mortgage, I was in the mortgage business, and I call a title company, and I'm, I get the person on the phone, and I immediately just start talking business to them. And then they go, hello, Janice, how are you today? <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of, whoa, you know, because I didn't even say, I don't even know if I said their name, but I certainly didn't say, hey, how you doing? You know, hey, I need blah, 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 blah. I was just, this is what I want. And, you know, I just laid it out. And, like and it made, yeah, it was, yeah, I, I didn't have time for small talk. You know, I need my product now. <laughs> That's how it was in the seal. But it got me realizing that we do need to stop and smell the roses sometimes. Even yeah. when we're doing a video like this, there's times to smell the roses and appreciate the other people and and the weather and your dogs and, you know, that type of thing. So I just wanted to bring exactly. that up. Okay. Well, All I right. totally agree with you. I totally <laughs> agree. Well, we won't talk about the weather because it's actually not too bad today. But uh, anyway. <laughs> That's my, my, uh, you know, little bit on the way. Right. But I will. It's still cold. <laughs> okay. So Janice, why don't you All tell right. everybody what we're, who's our guest and what are we doing today? Yep. We have Sandy Holman back and we already did one with her, which was a great interview talking about days on the Apollo and we've got her back again and we'll continue talking about days on the Apollo and just her life and things, our mutual things together. Okay. So oh, without further let's ado. Bring on Sandy. Hi Sandy, how are you doing? Good. I'm here. How's the weather there? The weather is <laughs> is lovely today. We are expecting five solid days of rain starting Friday. But wow. for today it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Well let's let's get into this. All yeah. right. So and Where we left we, off last time? <laughs> yeah, where we left off last time, I'd said, let's talk about what it was like living on the ship. You know, we had the 30-second showers. We had a bucket issued to us to wash our clothes in. You know, but it, that's if you're in the dorm. If you're in a cabin, you had a sink. But the toilets were all down the hallway and that type of thing. So I figured we could talk about that and then get back into your history of jobs and things. What do you remember about life on the uh, on this Apollo, just in terms of just everyday living? Right. Well, um, what I remember was uh, the first eight months I was on the ship, we were just in Morocco and we sailed from Tangier to Casablanca to Safi to Agadir and then back to Safi and then Casablanca and Tangier. We went up, back and forth and back and forth. And there were no liberties for the first eight months. I don't know why, because when I got there, that was just the way it was. And I didn't under, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as a liberty. But apparently liberty, there was... Liberty is a day off for our, our non right, people. Right, right. Every other week. Right. If your stats are up. Right. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, forget about it. Yeah. So um, anyway... Uh, the, that was, you know, a time when I was um, getting to know people on the ship. And um, uh, I wanted to tell a story about when we were in Safi. Um, we were at Safi did not have a dock that we could go to. I guess it, the, the, it was too shallow at the docks. I'm not sure exactly, but we had to be at anchor um, just um, outside of the actual town. Um, and so uh, one day, um, Janice said to me, hey, 
um, why don't we go for a swim? And this must have been when I was on that schedule where I had some free time, which what definitely was not all the time, but uh, but when I was making hat packs, you know, I, I finagled my schedule so that I could have some free time during the day. And Janice says, let's go for a swim off the side of the ship. I don't remember how we got up. I mean, you know, the ship was tall. It must have been yeah. a ladder that went down. Yeah, we had a rope ladder that went down the side. Yeah. Some people climbed down it, or if you were me, you just jump off the well deck. Yeah, that wouldn't have been me. <laughs> I would have climbed down. So um, so I climbed down, and we're in the water, and we're kind of treading water, and it's because it was really hot. The weather was hot and humid. And 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 I'm thinking, well, oh, this is really fun. And then Janice says, well, just don't open your mouth. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? She says, well, you know, when people flush the toilet on the ship, you know, it just comes right out here into this water that we're swimming in. I'm like, oh, my God. Now you tell me. <laughs> she says, but it's fine as well, long as you keep your mouth closed and don't get underwater yeah oh you see it coming out the side so you know just to quickly get out <laughs> yeah so we got a whole group of you go swimming janice no, would you, janice, would you have a well i don't know that was the only time that i went swimming in safi and i never did yeah. it again i can tell you that well no <laughs> matter where the ship went the same problem was going to occur <laughs> right. But most of the time we were tied up at a dock, you know. Uh -huh. So um, what I remember uh, was that the food was really bad in Morocco. We had um, milk that came in these little weird triangular cartons that was like, you know, lasted forever on the shelf. It was, it must have been highly pasteurized or something, <laughs> ultra pasteurized. I don't know. It didn't taste like milk. It was really, really nasty. Um, and the food was not very good. In fact, most people uh, went away hungry because the food was so bad. And then you'd go to the canteen sometime during the day when the canteen was open and uh, eat. Um, well, that was when I first had a bagel with cream cheese. I'd never had that before. And uh, Dan Siegel was running the oh, yeah. canteen. Yeah. And he, yeah, and he was... Yeah, and he was Jewish, and he introduced me to bagels and cream cheese, and um, which was great. Anyway, uh, we also bought our cigarettes at the canteen, and the we mostly twenty-five cents. And we mostly smoked um, English cigarettes, which are far superior to American cigarettes. Uh, do you remember how much you got paid when you got paid? Or, or yes, I do. Eleven dollars and forty-five cents a week. <laughs> I remember distinctly. Yeah. It, but it used to be ten dollars. Oh, it, it was eleven dollars when I arrived. Uh-huh. So it was eleven dollars and forty-five cents a week, which actually went kind of far in Morocco. And later when we were in Portugal, went pretty far in Portugal too. But you know, you could go see a movie, you know. I, I always thought it was funny that, you know, rather than rounding it to $12 or 11 we're going to give you 45 cents and change. When I joined the Sea Org, it was $17.20. And yes. you got $17 in cash, and two dimes had to be yep. taped onto the invoice yep. and for, for 600 crew. And it was ridiculous, yep. you know? Yes, yes. Well, absolutely. We also, we also got paid in the currency of the country we were in. That's right. So if we're in Portugal, we got Escudos. Right. And if we were in Morocco, we got dirham. Right. You right. know, and yeah. Greece, it was drachmar. It was like whatever country we were in, yeah. Yeah. we got we got that in our paycheck. Yeah, wow. that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then when we go to, if we were in Portugal and we sailed to Morocco, you could go down to Treasury to the cashier and exchange your escudos for dirham. Yeah. 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 Later, when we get into the audit project, I'll tell you about what a mess that made with the accounting. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, uh, <coughs> um, what else? Well, we didn't have any liberties, like I said, for that first eight months. And then we sailed overnight to um, Madeira. And uh, I woke up 
and looked out the porthole and I was like, it was like fairyland. It was so beautiful compared to Morocco. It was just out of this world. I mean, Madeira is, it almost looks like Monaco, you know, it's just really, really beautiful. And, um, and we, you know, we got a Liberty when we first got there it was the first one and it was just fabulous. And, um, it was, uh, I don't remember what my position was. And I was probably when I was Sea Org personnel control officer, which we talked about last time. Right. Um, I, I did get, uh, canned off of that job and had my first comment and, um, Dave Murphy was the chairman of the committee of evidence. And um, I didn't realize, you know, I was kind of like, hi, Dave, how you doing? You know, and uh, he let me know, boom, and no uncertain terms. This is serious business. We are not messing around here. You, you know, you, you need to shape up here. And we're, we're talking about high crimes. And um, they wanted to offload me because I'd, messed up so badly on that job. Oh, oh, also on that job, I had my first um, messenger run. Um, did I talk about that last time? I don't think so. No, you did. You didn't. But let so me it, just interrupt. Let me. Dave Murphy was the chief engineer and he'd been in the Sea Org since the early days. And he was, I think he was probably a lieutenant by that time. Yeah. So he was someone of stature and rank, right. which is but why. I, yeah. But I was and, and also friends with all the snipes. Right. So also, I thought. A COMEV, a COMEV is called short for Committee of Evidence. It's a justice action in the C organization in Scientology. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So um, when I got my first messenger run, it was Terry Gillum who came down. And, um, you know, she comes up to my uh, desk and she says, the Commodore wants to know. And I said, hi, Terry, how you doing? <laughs> and she, she goes, no, 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 no. She was actually really sweet about it. She says, no, here, here's how this works. I talk to the Commodore and he tells me what he wants me to say. And I come down to you and I completely duplicate his tone of voice, his facial expression, his demeanor, and I tell you, it's as if you're talking to the Commodore. And then you give me your response. And I run back up to his office and I tell him and I, and I, you know, again, I duplicate you. And so he understands, you know, and so I'm the conduit, you know, that's all right. I am. And yes. Commodore, just for our viewers, is L. Ron Hubbard. That, that was his title, Commodore. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, that was... Uh, that was my first messenger run. And what it was about was we had um, FEBC students on the ship flag executive briefing course. That's right. And they were um, studying to go back to their orgs and be, be the executive director and the organizing officer. And, you know, depending on how many students were there from each org, the, so the Commodore wanted to know um, how I was going to post these people when they returned. And he then ended up giving me very explicit directions about how to do that. So, so I got that part right. But, <laughs> but other than that, I didn't do very well on that job. 20 years old, didn't know anything about anything. And right. um, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, so when I got my committee of evidence, they wanted to offload me, but um, Otto Roos stepped in and convinced Dave Murphy to uh, just assign me a condition of enemy. So um, I had to work my way up from that. And that was when I got um, busted, I think busted, either busted back to the galley or went to Mimeo become the Minmio reprint operator, which we did talk oh, about. Okay. Last time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, Madeira yeah. was magical. And um, uh, I went with um, Otto on a motorcycle ride around the whole island one time. And um, 
I saw people living in caves and mm -hmm. people washing their clothes in the river. And I, you know, I mean, I'm a California girl and I, I, it was shocking to me to see people living like that. Um, I'll never forget it. It was just yeah. really an eye opener. And you go to those little villages and there was always that town fountain where everybody gathered their water coming out of the side of the hill. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they'd be pumping away at the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it sounds like it sounds like you know we were just having a good time, but we were working our asses mm -hmm. off in between these brief little episodes of fun. Janice, so, did you go to Madeira on your recent cruise? On your recent no. trip? No, you didn't go. No. To, okay. Yeah, Madeira is a little um, Portuguese island off the coast of Morocco. Just for yeah. anybody who you doesn't know. You know, Sandy, I remember the first time we sailed into Madeira, one of those little, um, a, a boat came up and docked right beside us with this group of dancers and singers doing these these national Portuguese dances. Wow. And, they, and it was like, they were, you know, they pull up besides all the different cruise ships and they pull up beside us. No one comes out on deck. No <laughs> one's watching them. <laughs> We were too busy working. <laughs> they, never, they never came back, but I'd see them hit the other ships. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever go to the carnival in Madeira? I don't think so. Oh, there was a carnival. You just walk around to the other side, and there yeah. was a carnival, and that's where I was like my first thing of seeing how donuts were made in this boiling oil and, you know, them sitting there flipping them over and putting the sugar on them. And we used to just go there and have, just walk around. It was like a new experience as a teenager having never been to a carnival before. <laughs> right. There was, a, there, I remember there was a casino there that some people like to go to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's I also when remember... Gave as a PR thing, I think it was a PR thing. Um, the girls formed a basketball team. The, 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 that uh, Wendell Reynolds, yeah, you were on the you were on the basketball team. We've um, shown photos of that before. <laughs> okay, and yeah. Wendell Reynolds was the was the coach. Yeah. And later, you know, after I left the Sea Org, I had. Uh, you know, everybody has their nightmares. We can get into that way later, but everybody who left the Sea Org that I've ever spoken to about it had nightmares for m months or years afterwards. Yep, and, I did. Uh, yeah, and one of my nightmares was was Wendell and you guys chasing me in the streets of Madeira. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the basketball funny, you, funny you say that because... The day of the rock festival, I was playing basketball that morning and because I was off and I came out of the gym and there was this group of men all standing around in these angry voices talking and I kept hearing Apollo uh -oh. and it didn't click. Yeah, I, okay, you know, and then I go off and then interestingly enough, it was Wendell and Ellen who were chased by the angry mob through Madeira. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, just so for our viewers, the, the, rock festival, dream. the rock festival is a famous incident that's been covered in Mike's book. We're going to do a show on it and all that. But that's when basically the locals protested against the ship Apollo and you guys had to hightail it off because they were yeah. throwing rocks and everything at your boat. It, yeah. It's also in my second book. I cover it, right. but but I've got about five people who were all on the ship at that time or at the hotel, and we'll we're gonna do a, a thing on that and talk about it. Yeah. So after Madeira, um, I think we probably went back to Morocco. Um, I know eventually we went to um, Lisbon, and there were three ports in Portugal that we went to. We went to Setubal which was south of Lisbon, and then Lisbon, which is kind of right in the middle, and then um, Porto, which is in the north part. And um, I was recently back in Portugal just last year and got to, I didn't get to go to Setubal, but um, the other two I did visit and I 
realized all that I'd missed when I was there before. Um, but uh, in um, Lisbon, we went into dry dock and we were there nine months mm -hmm. while the ship was being worked on. And I, I guess we had a gangplank that we would go in, we could get off the ship, but we still were working on the ship while it was being worked on, right? Yeah, we were and, working and living on the and ship. Living but most, in the ship. Yeah, but most people were doing um, the clean ship program. The people small enough were climbing in the vents and cleaning out the vents. And then, uh, so everything was being totally white, white, um, white gloved. White gloved. Would, yeah. Was that also when they started the, um, the Roach Derby? The Roach yeah, Darby, that was, yes. I, no, because, that started before. That started okay. before. Okay, so I want to talk about that because okay. <laughs> there were the first time I ever saw a cockroach in my life was on the Apollo, and it was Same infest, here. infested with them, and um, it, they were gross. I mean, you turn off the lights and out they came. You turn on the lights and boop, they're all scattered, but um, they were just so creepy, and uh, so. So the, we wanted to get rid of, Hubbard wanted to get rid of them. We all wanted to get rid of them. But so he did this, he had this program where if you found a nest, a cockroach nest, you would go find a Commodore's messenger and bring them to witness you destroying the nest. And then you got a reward like $2 or something. $10. And it was $10, $10 for a nest oh, wow. because you got a, you got fined if a roach was found in your bedding area. Right. Or your That's desk right. area. So you right. got fined like a dollar. So you, for destroying a nest, I think you got $10. Yeah. So that was big bucks. Yeah. I remember yeah. Mur Murdoch and people, <clears throat> there was some guys who any free time they had, they were off hunting for cockroach nests. <laughs> <laughs> Where were they hiding? Were they hiding in boxes or walls? Or what? In the walls, because you, yeah. you might have the bulkhead, and the metal bulkhead, and then you might have a wooden uh, wall in front of it. And so behind that would be a nest of cockroaches. You know, you're talking the ship was built in the 30s. So this is decades of cockroaches building. And to look at the plus side of things, at least the cockroaches were little, not commit compared to the the Florida oh. pimento. Oh, bugs. The palmetto oh, bugs in Florida. Florida. Yeah. 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 And, they, and, and the ones on the ship didn't fly. Right. And yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. But I remember yeah. when we were in Dakar, the the cute the quartermaster putting some cockroach powder around the bottom of the gangway and around all the ship lines so they wouldn't come up. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, didn't want because he didn't want the big yeah. ones. Yeah, he didn't want the big ones to come up the gangway somehow. Marching cockroaches marching up. <laughs> would you guys right. use like would you guys use like you know pesticides and things like that? Yeah. No. No. We didn't use pesticides. How did you well, I meant like really cockroach nest. powder, like you said? Yeah, like yeah whatever it is. Powder. Boric acid. Boric acid. Yeah, boric acid. Powdered a powdered thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I don't remember, remember the strain. Yeah, no, that wouldn't have gone over big with the Commodore. No, no, I don't. But remember I don't remember spraying. how we destroyed a nest. Smashing them. <laughs> <laughs> boom! Yeah. Boom! Boom! Rock slam that cockroach nest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's why it was mostly the older teenage boys who really got into killing those cockroach nests. <laughs> oh God! Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. But um, I, you know, uh, Roger, my first husband, um, uh, came onto the ship uh, I when we were in um, Portugal. And uh, he had been a registrar in at ASHO in Southern California in L.A. and um, was extremely successful. In fact, there was Yep, there he is at St. Hill when he first got into Scientology. And he, um, Hubbard did a, a one lecture where he spoke about um, putting two positions on the org board, Barnes in training number one and Barnes in training number two, um, because he was so successful 
at yeah. getting money. Um, anyway, he uh, he came on board the ship, and uh, I met him, you know, fairly soon. And he, um, I think he he asked me to come go ashore and have ice cream with him or something. And he s explained to me that he had a girlfriend back in L.A., so he just wanted to be friends. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'm good with that. And uh, and then four weeks later, he asked me to marry him. That's we hadn't, fast. We hadn't even kissed. I know. Hmm. I know. I thought that's, I said that's well, how it I, goes in the Sea Org, though. I know. I, mean, I, got married, I know. I got married to my wife Julie thirty days after we started becoming a couple. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, I said, well, I thought you wanted to just be friends, and he says, well, you know, I changed my mind. <laughs> So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we got married uh, like six or seven months later when we got our annual leave of absence and went to California. And that was when I had not been back home to California in two and a half years. And, um, and that was when my family met Roger. And we got married at our family cabin in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It was a beautiful wedding. After, after they had to handwrite the changes on the invite. Yeah, because because Roger was on a mission before the wedding and let me know he wasn't going to get back in time for the wedding. So all the wet, uh, invitations had been printed and my stepmother and stepsisters sat down and each invitation they had to cross out the date and hand write in a month later, which was a PR disaster with my family. <laughs> Needless bet. to say, why can't your husband make it to his wedding? <laughs> He's on <Yeah>. mission. <laughs> yeah. Saving the world. Yeah. Yeah. Roger was very dedicated. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, he was. yeah. Can I show some of the more of these pictures and then you can tell whatever stories are attached sure. to them? All right. Okay. So after we got married, we came back and I was working in the galley and uh, I talked about this briefly last time. Ann Burgess came on as the assistant guardian for flag for the ship. And she, um, Mary Sue, well, the IRS had, had uh, sued, I think for um, back taxes and we decided, and Mary Sue decided that we needed to do an audit of all of the uh, financial records of the Sea Org from inception, which was 1967. So she brought uh, to the ship uh, Marty Greenberg, who was uh, Hubbard's personal certified certified CPA, certified public accountant. Thank you. Yes. Um, of uh, Greenberg and Jackson. And um, Marty came onto the ship and uh, a few other people came on um, to do this project. There was um, Carl Hill, from, who was a chartered accountant from the UK and a girl named Isabel and uh, Jim Jackson came with Marty. Mark, can you uh, show the next picture? Sure. That's There's Marty. Marty. So, so we were located. Oh, well, so Ann Burgess took pity on me. She walked into the dining room one day and I was crying because <coughs> I was working so hard. It was making me cry. And she asked me what was wrong. And I said, I'm just so tired. <laughs> and she, so she, uh, she ripped me out of the galley and assigned me to the audit project. Um, and then the front here on the left, you see Ellen Reynolds. Behind her is Ted Street, who came to the ship for the audit project. Um, but next to him is Peter Gillum, Jr. My brother. Next, mm -hmm. right. next to him is, in the back, very back is me. Right. And then to the right is Marty Greenberg. In front of Marty is Jim Jackson. And Carl Hill is right there in the center of the front row. Now, now, Sandy, Sandy I, I, go ahead, Janice. I, I just wanted to bring up on Greenberg and Jackson. That's Marty Greenberg and Jim Jackson. And I actually just talked to Jim three days ago. And we were talking about 
uh, he's like, you know, they still have the name of Greenberg and Jackson. Marty's dead, and I'm I've been declared and not part of it for years. He's like, but they're still using my name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, Wendell must have taken this photo because he was also on the audit project, uh, and he's not in this photograph. Okay, now I want to ask you a question, Sandy, just because I personally don't know, and I'm sure some of our viewers don't know. What is, I mean, we know what auditing is in Scientology. It's processing, right? But but what's an audit have to do? How, what does that involve when you audit right. the financial records for the C organization? What, what's in Right, what's in so we, 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 were, we dug up all of the um, records from uh, 1967 to the present, which would have been 1973, I think, April, um, yeah. or some, yeah, something like that. And um, <clears throat> uh, basically, um, well, I knew nothing about finance or numbers or, you know. So um, my job on the audit project was to, because I had neat printing, uh, we had big ledger sheets, you know. Right. This that, is before computers, everybody. Before, no computers. Yes. No computers. We had hand crank Olivetti audit adding machines. <laughs> um, there weren't even, you know, calculators. Then. That's right. Yeah. And um, and Marty had me print all the headings on all of the spreadsheets, and um, I did that for a long time. Um, but what what it was happening was. The records went back to 1967, so it started with pound sterling, which there were three, you know, pound sterling, this is before pounds were put on the decimal system. So there were mm -hmm. pounds, shillings, and shillings. Pence. Yeah. And um, and it was there were it was on the it was instead of tens, it was twelves. So there were like twelve shillings in a pound. And so it was very complicated math, basically, but we had to, then the, we, they went from pounds to uh, drachma in Greece. And then, uh, so all these countries that we had been to and all these different currencies had to be exchanged. And, and, and amazingly, the um, original records from 67 forward were in immaculate condition. And it was um, Riva Spence who was doing, she was the flag financial banking officer and she kept beautiful books. Uh, I told her later she was unimpressed that I was impressed with her bookkeeping, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and, um, and, and so, so the first thing Marty taught me how to do once I'd headed up all these ledger sheets was um, exchanges between currencies, which would go on these big ledger sheets, you know, exchange from pounds to drachma, from drachma to, and every time we changed countries, we changed currencies. So it was the constant thing that was going on. And then he taught me how to do um, transfers between the bank accounts which was also involved different currencies. Um, although at that time, most almost all of the Sea Org reserves were in Switzerland. Um, and uh, then he taught me how to do bank reconciliations. So we, Marty was doing, Marty explained to me that, you know, bookkeeping is what we were basically doing. We were Categorizing that all of the um, categorizing all of the transactions, and Wendell and Ellen were doing more complicated stuff than I was doing, um, and they were going through all. I mean, we had everything was on paper, little pieces of paper. You know, we had disbursements. Every disbursement was written up. All the income was written up. Um, then bank reconciliations. I mean, it was very in depth. Uh, bookkeeping. And Marty's job um, was to, he has explained to me that, you know, bookkeeping is one thing, but when you get to a CPA's job, the CPA's job is to assign significances 
to the transactions. So, um, when <laughs> so he was trying to figure out ways to make it look like uh, money was not inuring to the benefit of L. Ron Hubbard because that would right. have kiboshed our uh, request for yeah, that's exemption. that's what the IRS was always looking for is yeah. uh, money yeah. going to Hubbard that he was right. just running Scientology in the Sea Org in order to enrich himself. Right, right. So um, that was Marty's head scratcher. <laughs> How can I sign this some other significance? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was the audit project. It went on for until we left the ship in 75, really. And in can I ask you a question? For, uh, yeah. Were Marty and Jim, Marty Greenberg and Jim Jackson, they weren't Sea Org members, right? They were no, public. no, no. So they were, were they paid? Uh, they basically were paid and came to the Apollo? What I was just going to get to that. Oh, sorry. Um, in exchange for doing this work, Marty was receiving free auditing ah. from class 12 auditors, mm -hmm. the top of the line. The best auditors on the planet were giving him his auditing. And this is different so, auditing than financial auditing, this audit. was, uh, Scientology <laughs> yeah. processing, you yeah. know, counseling. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Jim Jackson wasn't there for the whole time because he had to go back and keep the business running. Mm -hmm. And I don't yeah, really he was remember. there for two weeks. Two weeks. That's, that's all. That's oh. a, that's what he told me just the other day. Two oh, weeks. Wow. Huh. So while we were doing this audit project, um, Bruce Welch went off the rails. Yes. He was called Juicy Brucey, and he um, he was a, an engineer in the engine room, and we were um, in the very forward part of the ship in in the chain locker actually <laughs> i mean where we were you could see the chains for the anchors went right through the room we were in and they hung and so we're you know the ship the front of the ship is like this and um the bulkhead is here but it's got these struts that are like this you know keeping the strength of the ship in. And in between those, they hung with ropes, they hung plywood boards. And those were our desks. And that's what we were working on. And um, Bruce Welch went what they call type three. You know, he was at that age where um, a lot of people become schizophrenic uh, in the you know, early 20s. And um, he went schizophrenic. And he went completely bonkers. And he was locked up in a room right next to where the audit project was. So I got to hear his screaming and ranting and raving all day long, every day. It was really, really distressing. Um, he was given a bucket to eliminate his personal waste. He was uh, past food, but I, a lot of times he just threw the plates across the room. Um, it was uh, it was it was really bad. It went on for a long time because they were yeah. trying to wait for him to become destimulated enough that they could audit him, which eventually happened. And then as soon as he was, you know, no longer screaming and ranting and raving, they they offloaded him from the ship. And, and Hubbard claimed it a big victory. We've solved, we've solved this mental illness. You know, he's only, only auditing, only Scientology auditing can cure these people. Look at him. He's perfect now. And away he goes <laughs> before he collapses well, into his next, into his next fit. And, and that was when he, Hubbard came out with the introspection rundown. Right. Because I, I ran messages to Ron Schaffron, who was the auditor for uh -huh. Juicy Brucey. And and I think the reason why they ended up giving him a bucket is because on one of my message runs, I ran down the stairs and gave the message to Shaffy. And then as I was going upstairs, he they were bringing Bruce out to take him upstairs to the bathroom in the forecastle. And he saw me and he charged at me yelling, I'm going to kill her. And I turned around and I just belted out of there. 
bolted out of there, out onto yeah. the well deck and charged as fast as I could up those stairs. And they just jumped on him. And it was like, and I'm like, why would he come after me, you know? And it was any person, especially females, were restimulative to him. But I think after, and then they had some points of him doing, putting his feet in the toilet and stuff like that. So that's where it was like, I think that's when they decided just give him a bucket. But then he just made a mess with the bucket all over the bulkhead. And then he had, there was cabinets that he had pulled off the bulkhead and had crushed to push out the porthole. I mean, he, he had done some pretty crazy stuff yeah, yeah. Well, there. Now, I have to ask, because I'm sure the viewers are asking themselves the same question. Why on earth would you guys, or not you, but I mean, why on earth would the sea organization lock up somebody who was going crazy like that? Were you guys at sea or were you in a port or what was the we deal? Were, like, what was, we were in port. You guys trying to help no. What was the Hubbard, deal? My understanding from the message runs and so forth, Hubbard was trying to help him and calm him down so he wasn't just released out into the world being crazy and doing all this kind of stuff. So yeah. the idea was to calm him down through different auditing and then uh, have him go out. But yeah. it wasn't to release him out there. That would be like a madman and, you know, you don't know what he would do. Well, and it would be very bad PR for Scientology, you know, yeah. to let this, this total lunatic out there. And, you know, he, I mean, he wouldn't have even been able to, you know, take his passport and get on a plane. And he was like stark raving mad. Well, I mean, what other choices would there have been? I mean, you know, turn him over to the local authorities. Where where were you in Portugal or where, where was this? I we were going between Portugal and Morocco and Spain. You know, you don't just dump someone like that in a port, you know, and tell them, oh, find your way back to Amer to Canada, I think he was from. So right. that's where it's like, he needs to be calmed down. And that was Hubbard's thing is let's get him calmed down and audit him and let's see if we can figure out what will get him to be normal again. I'm sure he was never normal again, not until he got on some kind of medication. Yeah, but, I, I, I don't know yeah. what happened. Yeah. He was married to um, Ann Tidman's and, sister. And... Yeah, Annie Broker's older sister, Janice Tidman. Right. Mm. right. Yeah. She didn't go with him, I don't think. No. No. Yeah. So anyway, that was a, a, a chilling experience. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, it reminds me, when I first came on the ship, and Janice doesn't, re I've talked to her about this. She doesn't remember this, but I told you about when I first came on the ship and I got sick and I was back in the, sick bay in the aft part of the ship and um i wanted to leave and i had just read the um sea org uh new recruit hat pack and um in it there was a flag order that said if someone wants to leave then they're crazy and you need to um detain them until they come to their senses well, that freaked me out. And while I was sick, there was a woman in another cabin down the hallway who was locked up and she was Peggy. pounding on the door and trying to get out and trying <clears throat> to leave. And they, you know, it, and it, I mean, it scared the bejesus out of me. It really did because yeah. she well, wanted to go and they wouldn't let her. Peggy was another one. I, LRH would write her a letter and I'd have to slide it under the door and then wait until she answered it and then take it back up to him. And he did this whole thing, but she was locked up for quite a while. And yeah. then, and then she was offloaded. Yeah. 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 So that was, um, joy, joy, joy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you now, know, that me reminds me actually, did y'all did y'all think that basically L. Ron Hubbard knew what he was doing, and that's why this is okay to lock people up and all? Oh, this sure, other... yeah, sure. Well, no, not not that first time. That first time when I was first on the ship, I thought this place is scary. 
That's why I wanted to leave. I was scared. Yeah. But, you know, I got well. I, you know, the whole idea of when new recruits are, arrive, they're put onto messed work, you know. Physical matter, labor. energies. Yeah, physical labor, either in yeah. the galley, the decks, or the engine room. And the idea is to bring you into present time. And you're working 18 hours a day with physical work you don't have time to get into your head. You're just going through physical labor till you're exhausted. And so, you know, eventually <laughs> you do, you're just there and you're getting indoctrinated because you are studying two and a half hours a day and you are getting indoctrinated and the, yeah. you don't have time to think about anything. Well, and also, like, let's take Peggy, for example. Again, she, it was said that she would, she'd gone nuts. And being there, you believe that the auditing is what's going to help them. And first, you need to destimulate them. And then the auditing will help them become not so nuts and become a better person. And, you know, yeah. I don't think they did. They were, did she give, get any auditing? I don't know. I, I just my experience from being down the hall from her was that eventually she stopped screaming and pounding on the door and then they let her yeah. leave. And I don't remember her getting Norton. I remember carrying the letters back and forth between her and Hubbard. That's what I do remember. Right. And I remember another lady who went nuts, Christina. She was a Swedish girl. And, and I used to wonder, do people remember when they've gone nuts and done crazy things? And from her reaction, I thought they must remember it because when she was being offloaded, I remember Jerry Armstrong as the ship's rep arranging to take her to the airport. And she wouldn't leave the ship without a paper bag over her head because she, she didn't want to, I guess, I assume she didn't want to look at anybody or have anyone look at her. So <laughs> she came wow. out from, from aft and I remember watching her walking from aft to the gangway and down into the taxi with this paper bag over her head with little eyes. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I that, didn't know and that's where that. I thought they, she must remember it because she's embarrassed. Sure, that was sure, my sure. thought. Right, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, but I, I just, don't think um, I don't know that either one of them was actually schizophrenic. Bru Juice, Juicy Brucey definitely went schizophrenic. I don't yeah. know about the other two. Um, right. I don't I just, think they I, did. I, I realize this is years and years later. I mean, hindsight, right? But I mean, this shouldn't have been locked up. This should have been gotten rid of, right? I mean, I mean, you know, I know that we were, you, you all were, you know, believed in Hubbard and this and that. But I mean, if that happened to me today, if I ran into something like that, I'd turn them into the authorities. I mean, it's just, it's just the right thing to do. It's locking somebody up against their will is not the right thing to do, in my opinion. Well, well, since when did Hubbard do the right thing to do? <laughs> exactly. Hello? Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I just want to make sure that our viewers don't think that we think, oh, this is okay. We should have done no. it. I mean, no, it was terrible. No. Those were terrible but things that happened. Yeah. Yes. In, in my own defense, this is all I knew. Yeah. Well, you were, what, 14, you know, 15 years 11, old? 11 well, when she I, got I, on the ship. Yeah, 11 when I get on the ship, and the captain's word is the law. You know, right. when you sail in international waters, right? that right. is the law. You don't have police to call. You don't have any of that. And then if you go into dock, you're in a strange country. You're not going to go to the police and say, hey, they're locking people up there. You know, and then you think back and you think and you hear the stories of the military. When a guy goes off and he gets drunk, he comes back to the ship and gets thrown in the brig. In the until brig, he yeah. sobers up, you know, and that was how life was in those days. You know, so I was a little bit more advanced when I got to the ship. I was 19 and they had on Sundays, they had ships drills, which were run by Captain Bill Robertson when I got to the ship. And, um, and I went the first Sunday that I went to ship's drills, um, he was doing the, a, a drill called repelling borders. And he made up this story. Okay. Here's all these new recruits. Okay. 
the FBI and the CIA are trying to get on the ship and they're going to just, you know, arrest LRH and blah, 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 blah. And we have to repel these borders. And I thought to myself, this guy is nuts. I did not buy <laughs> into was. it at all. Yeah, it turns out he was crazy as a loon, but <laughs> but but no, everybody else was into it. Oh yeah, yeah, let's let's go fight the FBI, fight the CIA, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, I'm out of here, man. I am so out of here. I went back to my cabin and hid, and I never went to ship drills again. Oh really? Uh, yeah, I I just refused to go, and well, I never got caught. Wow. Well, talking Although, of repelling borders. We, I was on a drill once on the Apollo, and we decided we were going to go take over the Avon. So we lowered a lifeboat, and the Avon was docked right behind us, and we quietly rowed over to the Avon. We Avon climbed River. aboard. The, yeah, we climbed aboard, you know, like pirates climbing aboard the ship. And the quartermaster kind of got a repelling borders and starts yelling. And meanwhile, we're running to the, to the hatches in the front and sealing the hatches so that everybody was on course down below <laughs> oh god and we managed to take the ship oh that's almost like you know capture the flag when we were at camp when i was a kid yeah. you know yeah you know, yeah you're basically right. trying to capture the flag without the other side knowing about it or anything like that no right. i just bring this up because you know in my time i i was never on the ship i was in clearwater and then i was in, at the international base in gilman hot springs right and, uh, you know, I saw a lot of abuse of things done, but I can't ever recall people being locked up. Now, I did hear stories about it. Like, you know, these are all stories that happened, right? I remember when Roger and Kerry Gleason and David Mayo and that whole th th thing happened in 82, that they were restricted to the base. And I'd heard, but I didn't witness, Bill Frank supposedly was locked up under guard, right? But I just never, it, uh, the, the, the normal everyday Sea Org member, they wouldn't see that. I, that was not, you know, these security situations were always kept under wraps. Like, I'm, cool. I'm like, these are new stories to me that you're telling me on the ship. I'm sure it was probably the same there. You know, it, it, was, it was probably kept pretty confidential in terms of these different people going crazy, right? Right. Yeah. Well, not, well, not Bruce Welch. Bruce Welch, well, because your office was right next to where he was being Well, no, kept. but also the whole ship knew that, about what was going on because yeah. LRH yeah. was was writing. He was he was developing the introspection rundown on Bruce, and so and bragging about it. You know, in the probably in the orders of the day. I don't know. Somehow we all knew yeah. what was going on, um, and in yeah. fact, when Bruce left the ship, the whole crew came out to wave goodbye to him. Do you remember that, Janice? Yeah, yeah I do. Saying, Bye, yeah. Bruce. Yeah. Thank God he's out of here. But, yeah. uh, but you know, when with, with that comment that you're talking about with Carrie Gleason and Bill Franks and, and Roger Barnes, Roger, yeah. I know Roger had an armed guard outside of the room he was locked up in. He, managed, he was actually armed? The guard yeah. was armed? Yeah, Jim Cup was his guard. Remember oh, and Jim, Jim had, had a gun? Yes. Oh, According well, I Roger. know when I was locked up for 11 days, they weren't armed. They were just other people who were assigned to guard the door and not let me out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, see, Jim, I, and the yeah. thing is, it's like when I wanted to leave, you know, I actually, you know, physically, I they weren't going to stop me from walking down Gilman, you know, the Highway right. 79 in Gilman Hot Springs, but they, the security people would walk along with you. And I had no intention of breaking away and having them grab me, but right. I never felt like they would do that. You know what I right. mean? Like if I actually went like, I'm going to stop a car and get out of here. I didn't think they would physically restrain me. And I, they to did. me, no, I know. That's what I'm saying. In other words, like they actually did do that, which is really surprising because I work for David Miscavige and I work, you know, in high levels and all that. And all that stuff, these security situations and stuff, you know, Gary Jackson, Moorhead, and people like that were involved in. I'm surprised because that stuff was pr kept pretty quiet, obviously, because like I was on that committee of evidence that Roger and all these different people were on. That's right. But I was disagreement with it. It came up in my auditing. So I was sent to the RPF for being <laughs> disappointed because I didn't agree with it. I thought what they were doing was insane that they should be doing that. And it was coming up in my session. So they're like, 
we're getting rid of him. He's going to the RPF and pack. So that's what happened yeah. to me. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, it was different on the ship because we were in foreign countries. You can't just offload somebody in a foreign country. And uh, there was, at that time, there was a flag order that said if someone wants to leave, it means they're crazy and you have to lock them up. That was later canceled. Mm -hmm. It was, right. it was, it and, was later. Yeah. And it was implemented instead. If someone wanted to leave, they had to be off the ship within 24 hours of saying they wanted to leave. And right. that was pretty much stuck to. And if it was found someone was on the ship more than two days and they wanted to leave, the ethics terminal was in trouble for not getting them off the ship within the 24 hours. But again, the whole thing with Bruce Welch was a completely different story because he was he didn't ask to leave. He just went. He just flipped out. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you know, that does remind me of a story of a guy. He had slept with a minor on the ship. She was, I think, 16 or something or just under. And he was 21. And when Mary Sue found out about it, she stormed down to her cabin, strapped on a knife, put on her officer's cap, marched down and found this guy made him get on his knees and held the knife at his throat and told him to get off the ship. Wow. And we were, we were in Agadir at the time in Morocco. He had no money. All he had was a unused one way ticket to America. And he was dumped on the dock and had to find his own way back. And wow. there's a whole story. I can go mm -hmm. into that later, but yeah, he was, Dumped on the dock, and I think Rudy Savage was also dumped in in Morocco after that mutiny. And I'm going to uh, interview Stu Moreau and ask him to talk about the mutiny against Norman Starkey. Um, I think I need to um, excuse myself for a minute. Well, we're my dog like. is. We're we're at the very end. If you want, oh, if you, we'll okay. Well, let's just let, no, no, no. We can wrap it up. I just yeah. my dog is. Um, I think I she needs to go out. Yeah. I yep. understand. Well, then if you want, you can, we can thank you right now and Janice and I can finish your business and you can go ahead and go. Is that all right? And we've well, got more to talk to you about. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. continue this next week. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay, Sandy. Thanks very much. You can go ahead and take care of your dog. Janice and I will carry on. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Right. Cool. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, all right. We're at the That's end fun. of an hour I've here. Enjoyed. I've enjoyed that. <laughs> I had that. no idea where we were going with this one, but, you know, it's yeah. more abuses on the flagship Apollo. It's just That's crazy, cool. crazy times, you know what I mean? But uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, Sandy, Sandy's a wealth of information, um, you know, and also it reminds you of different things that happened as, as well. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. Well, I wanted to say, Misha, don't start. <laughs> <laughs> If you've enjoyed our this this uh, briefing, please uh, subscribe to our channel. Hit that subscription button. Hit the like button and the mute button. Misha, come here. Come here. Anyway, so please subscribe to our channel. We would really appreciate it. Also, if you have any questions or comments on what we've discussed here, you can go down the comment section and, of course, write any uh, questions, and we, we check them on a routine basis. And then also, if you want to donate to our cha channel, you can buy us a coffee in the description. There is a link to that. Janice, why don't you say something real quick while I handle my dog, okay? <laughs> well, as Mark would say, buy us a coffee, whatever that means, but it's down below. And uh, also remember to rock slam that like button. That's right. Misha, come here. <laughs> anyway, I think it's time to say goodbye, and we will be back in a couple of days. Thanks for listening. Anyway. Yeah, we appreciate y'all being here. We appreciate you watching. And like I said, uh, please subscribe. Uh, our dogs uh, love us. They love you guys watching too. <laughs> and uh, oh. we want to say that thank you. We want to thank Sandy. Go ahead, Janice. Also, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, I am going to be in Clearwater. So anyone in Clearwater watching, if you want to come and do a meet and greet with me, I'll be in downtown Clearwater around dinner time. You can contact me on my email. Janice Gillum Grady at AOL.com and we can arrange whatever. I'll sign books and I'll just chat with people if they want to come see me. That's right. 
Okay, everybody, until the next time, we will see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.